Welcome, Phil and Iponica 2016 members. Konnichiwa, or konbanwa if you're a night owl. This is Linda Chance, and I'll be your guide to language, literature, and culture. Let me begin with some language notes for you, starting with how to read Romanized Japanese. Nihongo, Japanese. Phonetically, it's relatively simple. There are polysyllabic words that can sometimes be a little bit too long, but they're composed of short syllables. There are five vowels, a, i, u, e, o, pronounced much as in Spanish or Italian. The vowels stand alone or combine with consonants to produce a total of only 48 syllables. But Japanese is written with as many as four different kinds of orthography, Chinese characters, two different syllabaries, that carry only sound and no meaning, and the occasional Roman letter. If you're reading in English about Japan, the vast majority of academic writing is published with modified versions of the Hepburn Romanization system. A chart arranged in modern ordering of the sounds with Hepburn Romanization looks like this. You can study the chart at your leisure. There are only a few things on it that are difficult. In the middle, you'll see T-S-U, Tsu, which is pronounced like cats without the ka part. Su, which is pronounced by putting the teeth to the lower lip. And of course, notorious in every language are the R sounds. In Japanese, we're about third of the way between R, L, and D of English when we pronounce da, du, du, de, do. Some of the consonants may be voiced. You'll see an apparent irregularity in the chart, but this reflects difficulties with our alphabetizing system. Uh, the Japanese writing system is pretty consistent, as are the verb forms. Uh, you'll see things like S plus E, Romanized for us, S-H-I, and pronounced she. T plus E, Romanized C-H-I, and pronounced chi, etc. Japanese also uses a kind of diphthong like glide with some of the vowels, ya, yu, and yo, that produce the words like Tokyo and Kyoto, which are a little bit difficult for Westerners to pronounce correctly sometimes. You'll also note that at the end of the chart, there's a syllabic nasal, which has lost its vowel. It's romanized as N or occasionally M. It's pronounced the same in Japanese either way. There is an apostrophe following it in romanization when there might be confusion. So note the difference between man yoshu, man apostrophe yoshu, and ponyo, the Miyazaki Hayao movie, which is properly ponyo and not ponyo, although in effect they sound about the same. The consonants may be doubled, which is indicated by repetition of the letter. This is also a little bit difficult for English speakers, but not impossible. In standard speech, the vowel U is quite weak. It almost disappears at the end of words and between unvoiced consonants. So something that is Romanized D-E-S-U and very common in the language as the copula is pronounced des, not desu, usually. Finally, the vowels, o and u, and some of the others less often, may be doubled, which means they're pronounced for two beats, and it's indicated different ways in romanization. These markings are usually omitted from words that are common in English, such as tonkyo or Shogun. In pronouncing Japanese, each syllable is the same length, and there is no discernible accent. So try not to speak Japanese with the stress accents that you're so accustomed to in English. 
Pronounce it without moving your head or your voice up and down, in other words. I'll teach you two useful words. I hope they'll be useful. The first is arigato. Arigato, thank you. Probably many of you know this already. The second is domo. It can mean very, and it can combine with arigato to produce domo, arigato, thank you very much. It can also mean pardon me, domo. Somehow, domo. Sorry, domo. Hello, domo. Etc., etc., depending on the intonation. It's obviously a quite useful word. The only thing it doesn't mean is please, as in please go ahead, which is dozo. This please does not mean please give me something. Let's try to avoid saying that in any case. Dozo. Then let's begin. I'm tasked with introducing you to something called Japanese culture, which even if I thought could be done adequately in 45 minutes, would not make a pleasant or even edifying survey. So I'd like to focus on two concepts that the Japanese and others generally recognize as being somehow key to Japanese culture. Those are omotenashi and omoiyari. These two terms are linked occasionally, but not necessarily. Omotenashi is usually translated as hospitality. It literally means to take care of, to arrange completely. And it's used most often in the context of service that a host offers. Omoiyari has been translated as altruistic sensitivity or pro-social behavior. According to Catherine Travis, quote, Omoiyari involves a general understanding of another's unspoken feelings, desires, and thoughts, a belief that one can do things to benefit that person because one has this understanding, and actually doing something about it. Although you will often hear it translated as empathy, that's not such a good translation because we tend to use empathy in negative situations. We feel bad for someone. And empathy does not imply that we take action, which omoiyari does. Omoiyari literally means to send, yaru, your awareness, omoi, to someone else, to be considerate, in other words. It appears most often in the field of psychology or in discussion of moral values in Japanese society. Both are de-verbal nouns, meaning that they derive from verbs, omotenashi from motenasu, to arrange, omoiyaru, to anticipate someone else's needs, is the source of the noun omoiyaru. The O of omotenashi is an honorific that's not always obligatory. One can speak of motenashi, although very few people do that these days. It is such a respected concept. The two terms come together in the discourse about manners and attention to other people's needs. To illustrate the difference between them, omotenashi is what I provide in putting together this PowerPoint. Attractive illustrations, hopefully, text that attempts to be entertaining someday, and so on. I express omoiyari toward you, the listener, when I try to imagine what questions your experience of the PowerPoint will bring, then give translations, definitions, pronunciations that I think you'll feel a need for as you go through it. Along those lines, I'll now give you some of the history of these terms. The word motenashi appears in 10th century tales with the meaning to display a behavior or attitude. It came to mean to treat to food and drink in about the 15th century. Some scholars go even further back in time to link omotenashi to the mid 8th century poetry anthology, the Manyoshu. 
The anthology has some 4,500 poems, of which 270 were recited on or at banquets. At such entertainments, allies and enemies both were kept close through drinking, feasting, and singing. The guests were, by rhetorical convention, always reluctant to part, as in this poem. And now Okura really must be departing. My children must be crying, and their mother too must await my return. Whatever they think about the earlier history of Omotenashi, most everyone is in agreement that it's tied closely to the medieval practice of tea, or cha no yu, hot water, yu, for whipped green tea, cha, sometimes unfortunately called tea ceremony in English. By the late 15th century, host and guest were gathering to drink this stimulating beverage and take a meal with a rather precise etiquette eventually developing. The lodging industry in particular likes to assure patrons that their hospitality cues to the high standards of service found in ritual tea gatherings, such as you see here. Omoyari also first appears in the tales, diaries, and histories written by women in the 10th century, where it evokes their closeness to one another, they're always thinking about each other, and distance from those they desired. They could only send their thoughts and poems because they weren't allowed to actually go out after the men they were thinking about. Nowadays, omoyari, or thinking of others, is earnestly invoked when attempting to inculcate a high level of concern for others in such public arenas as school. Children receive explicit advice to be more thoughtful of their playmates and classmates. There's quite a bit of research in English on this. And when asked what moral values are important, Japanese rank omoyari highly. It is the third most commonly mentioned valuable personal quality in one recent survey. Omotenashi is subject to efforts to export it. Business journals tout the special qualities of Japanese hospitality and analyze how it differs from expectations in Western service industries. Hotel service is, or should be, efficient. Omotenashi, instead, unfolds over time as the guest notices that the host has splashed the walkways with fresh water in advance or appreciates the flowers in the alcove. These things are not really necessary, of course, but they increase your understanding of the host's concern for you. Visitors experience this type of omotenashi in traditional inns at Dogo Onsen, hot springs which you will visit. I suppose, too, that important 20th century writers also enjoyed such service in Dogo. These include Natsume Soseki, who wrote Botchan, a comic novel lampooning provincial teachers. Uh, this is probably the most popular modern Japanese novel, uh, although if you read it in English translation, you may not be so sure of where the appeal lies. Uh, it's frequently brought up in popular culture. A second modern author with close ties to Dogo was Maka Masaoka Shiki, who was born in Matsuyama and died there of tuberculosis in 1902. He's the person who gives us the term haiku for that 17-syllable uh, poetry form that you've all heard of many, many times. So he has an important role to play in modern poetics. If omotenashi is an export item, omoyari has its place largely in domestic discourse, with educators and etiquette mavens calling for more of it all the time. A recent example is seen in a humorous television spot from the Osaka Bureau of NHK, the National Public Broadcaster in Japan. If you click the hyperlink, you can watch the fourth of the videos. 
A man in drag pedals on the sidewalk, ringing the bell at pedestrians. Bicycles are vehicles. They must use the street and not the bell. Both bicyclists and pedestrians need omoyari, we are told. In the end, the bicyclist tells the pedestrians that the bell sound, chirin, chirin, is her name, and she was not attempting to rudely ring at them. Now, uh, this particular ad is uh, in drag because they want it to be memorable, I think, that has nothing to do with the omoyari side of things, uh, but still interesting that this kind of attention is given to the subject. Omotenashi also gains a moral veneer via the folk etymology without nashi surface omote or without two-sidedness ura omote nashi lack it. This association with other words links to the notion that omotenashi hospitality bears no expectation of reward that is done without any distinction between surface and depth. Yet omotenashi is clearly a commodity, as we see in 7-Eleven's visual for omotenashi bento. Yes, they're suggesting that you serve lunch boxes from your local convenience store when your guests have occasion to arrive in formal kimono attire. They'll never know the difference. Omotenashi has a complicated history of gender implications that commentators frequently ignore. Take, for instance, the Museum of Hospitality Culture, the Sumiya Motenashi no Bunka Bijutsukan. I just can't say it. In Kyoto's Shimabara district. If you tour the museum's main building, staff will do their best to assure you that this was a site of clean living. One of the frequent guests even brought his mother along to this cultured salon. This is in spite of the fact that the area was once a walled pleasure quarter to which women were sometimes sold into bondage by destitute families. Admittedly, the Sumia building hosted the elite patrons of the arts and music and called only the most gifted women entertainers to its parties from such okiya as the wachigaya, where female entertainers live to this day. And though these entertainers are today strictly artists, even when they parade their bodies through the streets in the old manner, to completely erase the ways in which servile women traditionally provided hospitality is not to tell the whole story. Uh, in this light, I recommend to you the article on women in workers that uh, is provided because it does highlight how women express their power through this kind of activity today. Permit me to propose that omoyari has an unspoken pedigree in literature, especially that written by Japanese women. One of the memorable and much commemorated episodes in the great early 10th century narrative, The Tale of Genji, shows the consequences of failing to think about another's feelings. The setting is the Heart to Heart or Aoi Festival. Royal Tyler's charming translation, heart to heart, I like. The wife of the eponymous hero Genji decides to distract herself from her pregnancy by going out to see a spring parade. She encounters one of Genji's paramours, Rokujo, a well-born but somewhat older lady who has also come to watch the procession. Genji's wife known as Aoi, after this chapter and this festival, lets her ox cart runners push the older woman, Rokujo, to the back of the crowd, utterly humiliating her in what is called the clash of the carriages. Later in the chapter, Aoi gives birth to a son, causing her young husband Genji to see her as a woman for the first time 
and also to hear her speak in the voice of the distraught older lover who has possessed the young wife. Aoi shortly dies, victim of her callous treatment of Rokujo. The ghostly figure here in the spider robes is thus not the wife, but the jealous lover. As Genji's father, own father had told him, never cause a woman to suffer humiliation. Treat each with tact and avoid provoking her anger. Rokujo's anger reappears in literature in the 15th century no play, Lady Aoi. This features a woman who dreamed of beating her rival. It also takes the form of a demon who is chased away but not palliated by a sorceress. We see Rokujo's jealousy at her mistreatment and uh, chagrin at her mistreatment again in Enchi Fumiko's novella Masks, which draws on the legacy of the tale of Genji and also the No Theater. She uses these highly expressive masks to make her point about women's suffering. A second famous literary episode deals with acting in someone else's presumed best interests. It comes near the end of the Tales of the Heike, the martial narrative of the wars of the late 12th century. Kumagai no Jiro Naozane, a rough eastern warrior fighting with the Minamoto side, is pursuing a young noble of the Heike or Taira family. That's the noble attempting to flee to a rescue boat in the water. Kumagai challenges the youth to turn back from his attempted flight, pulls his opponent off his horse, and pushes back his helmet, planning to behead him. Heads were used as proof of valor and source of reward in these wars. Kumagai sees that the noble is his own son's age and hesitates to stab him. But he then notices that 50 mounted warriors are riding up, and Kumagai tells the youth, let me kill you. I will pray for your salvation afterward. Stab. The episode ends with Kumagai becoming a monk and learning that his opponent was Atsumori, a high-ranking noble. Now this is something of a true story. We know that there was a warrior named Kumagai and that he became a monk. But he became a monk on account of his peak at losing a lawsuit against his uncle. The romantic story is different, but imbued with the values of praying for another. Another piece of literature from an author with romantic tendencies is Summer Flowers by Harataniki. I mention it here with some trepidation. Like many writers before and after him, Hara committed suicide. But not everyone is convinced that he did so in 1951 because of his concern that the U.S. was about to use atomic weapons in Korea. To the extent that this was a motivation for his suicide, it might be called an incident of omoi yari, being concerned about others. In any case, his novella is based on notes he took in Hiroshima at the time of the bombing, and the two documents, his notes and the literary treatment, make a rare study in the transformation of trauma into literature. They're also quite short, and for that reason only, easy to teach. I offer them in preparation for your visit to the Hypo Center, Ground Zero at Hiroshima. Omotenashi no Omoi Yari linked to Japan's imagined futures in intriguing ways. It's popularly believed that a speech on o mo de na shi clinched Tokyo's bid for the 2020 Olympics. You can listen to the speech here and you will know why I pronounce each syllable separately. The so-called cool Tokyo ambassador, Takigawa Kuristeru, a Japanese-French broadcaster, spoke in French, her own kind of omotenashi, 
before the International Olympic Committee Congress, and they were supposedly wowed by the whole idea. In advance of the 2020 Tokyo Games, highly anticipated to accomplish as much for Japanese culture and the economy as the 1964 Olympic Games did, the government has already begun a nationwide campaign to encourage omotenashi hospitality behavior. In the city of Kyoto, too, ads urge citizens to reflect on what it means to be a city of hospitality. You can click, click on the link and see what they hope visitors will think after they visited Kyoto. Ads ask people to engage in everything from helping to preserve cultural heritage to watching out for criminal behavior. Here we have the mayor with uh, safety mascots to volunteering together to make all this and the modern Japanese family work. Omoyari, by contrast, is the target of anxiety. Has the younger generation lost the ability to think of others thanks to their reliance on screens? The less critics witness omoyari where they think it belongs, the more they call for people to embrace it as a special Japanese birthright. In the end, the tendency to want to promote use of the native terms for hospitality and thinking about others speaks to Carol Gluck's insight that identity is the key issue in modern Japan. Many Japanese wish to know what distinguishes them from others, and these two concepts fill the bill in some ways. I hope they'll help you make some sense of what you observe in Japanese culture as well. Thank you.